Welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director. Today, we come to you direct from London at the headquarters of Studio Moross. Studio Moross is a creative design studio focusing on art direction, branding, print, and moving image founded by graphic artist and art director Aries Moross. Aries Moross is a graphic designer, illustrator, and art director recognized for their typographic illustrations. Aries set up Studio Moross in 2012, fueled by their desire to build a multifaceted team approach to a broader scope of projects. This sense of collaboration runs throughout the studio today, making its skill set extensive with work that includes live show direction, broadcast design, and festival campaign direction. The team finds themselves at home working with music talent, and the studio is known for the color and energy they bring to every project. Whether through branding illustration or motion design, their clients include MTV, Spotify, VH1, Nike, Warner, and the British Film Institute, to name a few. And now, before we turn it over to Aries Moross, let's look at a showreel. 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 Hello, welcome to Studio Moros. We have a quite a big studio in South London and we're based in Stockwell. And it's quite an unconventional place to have a studio. You wouldn't necessarily expect there to be a studio in South London. Most people expect you to be in Shoreditch or maybe in Soho. Um, these are like more traditional commercial spaces for design studios, but because I really enjoyed South London, I, I live here. Um, I wanted something a bit different. We also have a really nice space. We have a garden, we have outdoor space, we have more, more than one level, we have a breakout room, um, we have somewhere to come and have meetings. So this is a really important place for us. We've been here for about uh, six years now um, and it's something that is a really important part of our kind of company culture. And um, it's really, really nice to have people back again after two years of being here by myself pretty much. I've finally started to have a trickle through of my team coming back to work. So we're kind of half remote, half in situ, and then we are open and close certain days of the week. So so um, my team now, not everyone is here today, but we operate from a mix of remote and from the studio. Try and encourage people to come in because I feel like we learn more and there's obviously a nice social aspect to it. So it's myself. Uh, then I have a studio manager who, you know, she's responsible for just making everything glued together, keeping everyone happy and, with, you know, make sure they have what they need at home and in the studio. I've got two project managers and then I have design and video team and that number is quite flexible. We have like three slash four permanent designers and we have three permanent motion designers, but we work with freelance motion designers and all the time. So we often have three or four freelance motion designers on any job at a time um, on top of our internal team and that's just because of the sheer amount of video and digital work that we do um, and the different skills that we need which we aren't able to like do necessarily or internally um, and then we also have some staff who still work here but are on new parent leave so we have a new parent policy so if anyone has a baby or has a kid they can take a year off and enjoy their life and get to know their family. Um, so some of those people are 
on the team but aren't here or aren't working right now. And uh, yeah, let's go meet them. Well, this is the main room um, where everyone spends most of their time. But when I say everyone, like half of them are not here. <laughs> I have to introduce you guys, so you, you have to wave. We've got Ellen and Beck, who are project managers. We've got Zoe, studio manager. Santi from the motion design team. And then you've got the dogs. But we've also got lots of other people online who um, aren't here today, but we spend half the day on video calls with them. Um, but yeah, this is where we sit and try and stay organized. So this... Um, this used to be where we um, put all our jobs that we needed to do, and it was like a really big part of the studio to have this list of jobs, but it doesn't, it's redundant now. We have that online instead. Yeah, we've got all our like letters from our friends across the world, um, and our little notice board, and yeah, most people, like, we went from all having desktops to now everyone works on laptops because they're always moving around, and yeah. I think most, Creative people will say they were creative children. I think all children are creative, but I certainly was born with a desire to draw, create, make. I used to make things for my doll's house. I used to decorate my doll's house. Um, I was always very interested in drawing, recreating storybooks and, and illustration. That was something I was, was my thing, you know, when I was a kid. If I was bored, I'd sit down and I'd draw. Um, I continued to, like that, that it was fostered in me by my parents. Um, my mum used to hire babysitters who'd come over and she would specifically get people who would do fun, creative things with me, like making friendship bracelets or drawing or making dolls house furniture. And I was very like crafty as a kid. And I think I got really into computers as well. So I started playing computer games, um, was interested in using like publisher and these sort of softwares, which I guess wouldn't be conventionally used by by kids, but it was something I was really fascinated um, with. And I had internet at home from a young age. So I was, you know, a very ahead millennial, essentially. Like I had the internet in my bedroom, probably from the age of like eight or nine. My parents were very like liberal in their approach to what a young person should look like, act like, what they should do for their vocation. Um, they were very kind of happy for me to explore my creativity you know, to the point where my mum let me paint my own bedroom, um, you know, any colour I wanted. I had magenta walls and aqua skirting and lime green cupboards and yellow details and orange. You know, I was obsessed with um, just customising things and making them my own. And I went to a kind of what we would call a private school, um, though it, it's not kind of like a on the level of like Eton or, you know, the schools that you might hear about in the UK. It was an independent school. So it was a little bit more down to earth than a private, private school. Um, and it, I was very lucky that although the school was quite academic, it also had a creative and design and arts sort of branch. And um, I had a brilliant max very early on. Um, I was, you know, really fed the things I was hungry for. I was really fed them by my teachers. And I really enjoyed drawing, of course. And I got into more graphic, graphic art and design when I was at school, um, even in, you know, prior to going to university. And it was definitely something I was interested in illustration, like commercial illustration and design. I used to buy magazines and look at them. And, and I used to design posters and things for the school. And I was very involved in extracurricular activities as a designer, even though I didn't know that's really what I was doing. Um, and then over the course of my school career, you know, I, I left my, you know, my school to go to foundation, which is a free year of education within, within the arts that is offered to people under 18 in the UK, which is a brilliant uh, scheme. So I did a foundation, which is an exploratory year where you study five or six different topics in the first term and the second term you, you narrow it down and then you specialize and then you do a kind of final project before you apply for your um, university course if you want to go on and study art or design at university. So I went on to Camberwell College of Art, which is part of the University of the Arts London, and I did a bachelor's um, there over three years after doing my one year foundation. and. I did visual communication and at foundation and then I ended up doing a graphic design degree, which I had mixed feelings about. I, I definitely learned a lot about myself and about design, 
but I was very interested in commercial practice, not necessarily conceptual design practice. So although my school pushed a more conceptual design practice, they wanted us to think about the meaning behind everything. They, they, there was not really um, a big sway towards aesthetics at all, like aesthetic aesthetics was like not even really relevant it was about the meaning and the intention and process which is i think is an important lesson because you can learn about aesthetics anywhere like you just have to look at things to understand aesthetics um but i i enjoyed making th image making making things for the sake of making them making things because you like how they look generating things that stimulate you your eyes you know your mind um that don't require an essay to understand them, that don't require uh, a crit or an explanation for you to appreciate them. So my school was a bit kind of annoyed with me, I think for my interest in what they saw was kind of like vapid or superficial design potentially, or co commercial design as it was called. Um, and I, you know, my teacher would say to me, um, depth, not span, you know, all of this sort of stuff. And I was always, always sort of, I took it on board, but I definitely pushed against it because I was so interested in just making and exploring and visualizing things and learning how to use tools and, and learning how to use a computer and technology. I really enjoyed discovering like graphics tablets and Illustrator, Photoshop, you know, InDesign, Flash, um, all of these softwares that were, you know, coming like get coming onto the table in front of me and that I could make use of and try and use them to create new things. So I, you know, I, I may not have fulfilled my teacher's desires in terms of my interest in university, but I did work very, very hard and I did do the work I was required in order to get the grades I wanted. So I graduated from um, UAL and during the time while I was studying, I um, had picked up some illustration clients. Um, I ended up working kind of as a commercial illustrator from my second year at university. So alongside my coursework, I was also illustrating ad campaigns and editorials for magazines. And I had a record label and I was doing that. And some of the work I was doing outside university, I kind of used as part of my coursework to kind of support um, because it was just impossible for me to do the coursework and um, all of this external work. But I managed to get through that all. And fortunately, I was kind of already um, earning a living as an illustrator by the time I finished university, um, thanks to a couple of like bigger advertising jobs. And back then, budgets were larger and things like that. Um, and then after I left university, literally like before graduation, I, I left the UK and I went to live in New York for three months um, on a tourist visa because I just wanted to get away from it all. Um, I found like university quite overwhelming. I was kind of like going out in the scene as a club kid and partying and all this stuff. And I think I just wanted to have a fresh start. So I went to America for three months. I didn't attend my graduation. I didn't take part in my end of year exhibition with my staff, like with my colleagues or anything like that. Um, and I kind of just disappeared. And I think it was kind of a bit of an ego reset. Like I felt like maybe I was quite immature and I maybe just needed to take a step back from everything and think about what I wanted to do. So then I came back to London after three months and I got my first space. I got a studio space in, in central London, um, very small, um, just enough for me and one other person. And I started kind of in exploring more um, different disciplines. At the time, you know, I was, successful as an illustrator but I was always interested in design since day day one so I started revisiting design um, and I kind of continued to do that and then I ended up sharing a new space with friends uh, there was three or four of us designers and filmmakers all sharing a space and we sort of collaborated and some of those people were more traditional design some of those people were motion and and film so we we're kind of all learning from each other um and that we kind of worked as a sort of very loose collective for a year or two until i kind of realized over time what i really wanted and that was to create my own team because sometimes the, my friends that i was working with would be interested in my projects and sometimes they wouldn't be and I was just really keen to like find people that would always be interested in what I was working on and and ready to help or come through and with ideas or 
And then I kind of realized that the way that I would achieve that was by paying people to work for me, where their job was to be there and be like, oh, cool, let's do this job, let's think about this. So that's when I hired my first um, full-time designer, and that was in 2012. And um, that was the start of Studio Moros. And uh, yeah, it's our 10-year anniversary next year. So um, it's been a long journey getting to this point. We've been through different spaces. We've had over 28 employees through in the last 10 years. At the moment, we're at 11, uh, 12, I think now. And um, yeah, I've learned a lot of different things about my practice, about being a leader, about being a creative director, about understanding what my role is in design and my role is within my team and my role is for my clients. And yeah, it's, it's taken me a very long time to get to this point and no, I'm still not sure what I'm doing. And you know, it's a constant process of, of reflection, documentation, understanding what you do, what you're good at, thinking about what you want to do next. And like, it's, you know, your career is like a very finely tuned machine that you have to constantly tinker with and, and understand like, sort of like in almost a physics science capacity. And that's kind of what I'm doing all the time. So around about 2000 and I think it was eight or nine. Um, I was doing all this illustration work and I, I enjoyed it, but I was very keen to be back in the music industry and or not back in, I hadn't really been there. I've been doing the record sleeves for m my own label. And that's basically why I created the label. I was like, I want to work with musicians. No one's hiring me. So I'm going to create my own record label, meet musicians and kind of collaborate with them and make records for them and then maybe even more things around the record um, merchandise and whatever and I was selling t-shirts for bands like metronomy and telepathy um, and I basically was approached by this band called Simeon Mobile Disco who were working on a new album and they needed like music videos they needed what they were calling art direction. And this was probably one of the first times I heard the word art direction or uh, this is our art director or whatever. And I was like, okay, I only really knew what a graphic designer was, but at the time I was interested in film and I had sort of started doing bits of video and I had, like I mentioned, um, I had a studio mate, Hans Lowe, who was a filmmaker and I had a, a motion designer, Jack Featherstone in my studio as well. And I was like, okay, well, I think I can kind of make videos. Um, so initially, I actually started the work with um, a colleague of mine called Alex Sushon. And we, um, we made this kind of film in a warehouse. Um, I think it cost us like well, £1,500. We hired a, a projector. I think that was like the only thing we spent money on and the, and the venue. The warehouse has been knocked down. We hired a projector and Alex is also a musician and producer, so he knows how to work with music. So we, we kind of broke the song into lots of pieces and then made these animated kind of GIFs basically and flash and stuck them back together in Ableton because he used Ableton. We didn't know how to really use any other types of software. And then together we made this film, which is basically just dots moving around. <laughs> um, it's very basic, but it's all to the music. And it was like very kind of like nerdy music, musician slash graphic designer project. And then we projected this film in the warehouse on a big wall and then we filmed it from lots of different angles and that was the that was the piece and i mean there's a behind the scenes video that we made there's um there's and then the offshoot from that was we made some t-shirts um and then i ended up working across more projects with Simeon and then i ended up working with them for over three albums i think um and essentially became their art director i I did their album artworks, I did lots of music videos for them. I commissioned music videos for other people to make and um, I, I did their merchandise and was involved a little bit in their live show. Um, I sort of started to sort of, although very low budget and lo-fi, started to dip my toe into these other areas. And it really showed me that I could do that kind of work. I, I enjoyed developing a relationship with an artist and their music and talking about these themes and. And I think one of the skills I emerge, which is what happens when you start to like practice at your career, is that I was actually good at that, good at not just the design bit, like that was fine. And I work with other people in any areas where I was missing things, I could kind of 
find teammates to work with, but I was good at the communication part with the artists. I knew how to make them feel involved in the creative process and they trusted me and um, they felt confident that I could achieve their vision. And that's kind of how that started. And then over time, I built up like relationships with more commercial artists like Disclosure and Sam Smith and, and became sort of, the studio became known as a sort of small um, outfit that could do these campaigns for artists that were not enormous pop stars, but on their way up. And it was a unique time because we'd come off of the back of streaming starting and record labels cutting huge departments of people. So the creative directors and the art directors and the graphic designers at record labels had all been laid off. And so the, the graph, like, and you know, it wasn't like 4AD where they had in-house art directors, you know, it was all a bit more scattered around. And um, bands had kind of got fed up with using like the junior graphic designer to put together their album artwork, which is supposed to be like the most important thing they've ever made. And they would start to approach me to get them, get, uh, get me to make their album artwork come to life or their ideas and their vision. So I started being hired as kind of a bridge between the record label who would pay my check and the band who would like give me their brief. And I would kind of deliver something that was like commercially viable and good for all of the touch points that were needed in marketing. So at the time, we're talking about the emergence of people listening to music on YouTube. This hadn't really been a thing yet. So there were all of these new products and places which we needed to make creative things for. You know, I've had this conversation with like graphic designers who've worked like, you know, the, the icons of graphic design who worked in the music industry in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and their only output was a record sleeve and a poster and maybe some merchandise. They weren't creating um, music videos. They weren't creating animated visualizers. They weren't creating Instagram, social media. You know, the, there was nowhere near as much or as many areas in which the creative had to stretch we have to create like entire universes for musicians now. Look, we do Kylie Disco, okay? So you've got to do the single artworks, you've got to do the album. You've got to make music videos that fit into that world. You've got to create a live streaming experience. You need to make an Instagram filter. You need to create a merchandise collection and you have to make one for every single, you know? There is an enormous amount that of content and visual design and, and thought as well that has to go into everything that you make for an artist um, nowadays. It's not just like, the record sleeve, which it used to be. I think when I first started working in the music industry, you know, you had um, an album artwork and the single artworks. Um, you maybe had two pieces of merchandise. Um, you had YouTube videos and like, if it was a big band, they would have money from a label to like make proper music videos. So when I started like at Studio Moros, um, my first real client as an art director was Jessie Ware. So when I first started working with Jessie, my deliverables were a music video and a, sing and a vin vinyl single. And, you know, that was quite simple. So you've got the video marketing and then you've got the print. And that the, the, the singles were often digital. They weren't even physical singles. Um, and now, you know, every, with every year that was that was what, 2010 or something. Every year since then, there've been new platforms introduced, new ways of um, promoting the live music industry world has changed and changed and changed and changed again, um, especially with the COVID world where we've got live streams and um, interactive like audiences and just, just insane amounts of technology built around it as well. Um, so yeah, I think, that's why, I mean, I'm 35 now. I'm not necessarily up to date with what an 18 year old or a 17 year old is doing on the internet. So it's important for me to kind of con continue to hire and develop my team in order to relate to and understand the audiences of artists that, that are, you know, commercially active now. Um, but I also like feel like one of my special areas, I guess, and as a studio, and you have, to, it's important when you run a company or you 
even if you're self-employed to understand your USP, like what your unique selling point is, what's, what is it that you're good at that people look for you to, um, to do for them? And for me, I'm good at making things that aren't really cool, cooler. And I'm good at making things that are um, young for like younger audiences cooler or older audiences younger so i'm like good at making things for like let's look at one direction for example when i work with one direction uh 2015 um the band were a bit older but their audience is still quite young and they're in a transitional period where the band are no longer like young kids anymore they want to feel a bit more grown up they want to feel cooler so but i still need to appeal to their fans so i was brought in to kind of create that it's not like a kind of has to be cool and edgy enough for the band to like it, but it also has to relate to the fans. Or if you look at something like Spice Girls, Spice Girls, luckily the, the 90s was back um, in culture in 2019. But when I worked on that tour as the art director for the tour um, and I created the branding for the tour and the merchandise and all of these other things aside from like the live show elements themselves, I needed to make something that was sort of dated relevant again without it but retaining the nostalgia and making it feel relevant to also a new audience of young people who might be getting into the Spice Girls for like the nostalgia element and then uh, a generation of my age probably 35 to 45 who listened to the Spice Girls as a kid so you know I, I really enjoy that area like if you turned around to me tomorrow and you gave me an artist that was so cool I think I'd struggle to work on it because I like kind of unpicking that stuff I think and I like building um, building on it and and I like the challenge of having something that's more neutral and being able to push it or pull it in a direction rather than just reinforce coolness which is really hard um, and there are plenty of really very talented high P creative directors art directors designers out there who can do that kind of stuff and like make stuff every day that's you know mind-blowing and um, cutting edge i'm not that person i think as much as i wanted to be a cutting edge creative director i can appreciate that i'm not i'm good at bringing a bit of edge to things that are edgeless and i'm good at softening things that are a bit ratty and making them feel shiny and new again that's kind of where my speciality lies and i'm good at forming like trustful bonds with artists and and bringing their vision to life and respecting them and what they create um, I don't push artists into discomfort or make them do things that I think will be good for them. Most of my conversations about creating something around them that is genuine, authentic and um, isn't like applying a layer of fakeness onto what or who they already are. Um, and that taken me like 10 years to work that out. <laughs> Um, but I think it's an important journey for me and, and it means I know what kind of clients to work for and of course I still kind of get imposter syndrome like I've got a potential client coming up that is quite cool and I'm like oh am I cool enough to do this but I live in the faith that I'm, I'm working a team of people who have great ideas and references and, and know know a world of really talented and cutting edge creatives out there who we can um collaborate with and and things like that and i think then i remember okay it's all right like i've got i've got it i just have to like tie everything together and that's really what your job is as a creative director it's making choices from a in a commercial sense and and in a creative sense and in relation to the client to bring everything together and create something that is connected and, um, you know, not tangible, but like something that you can see and understand um, and communicate that with strength to whoever's looking at it. I think in terms of how I work with artists when I work with them, there's a lot at play. I mean, I think when I first started out, I didn't realize that my identity was part of that. I thought, you know, I'm just here. I'm a service provider. I will make this T-shirt. Um, but as I've, I think as we've all become more aware of identity and the importance of identity and, and intersection and our intersections, um, my identity itself has become more relevant to the types of people I work with. 
Um, and I think in relation to many projects I've probably done in the last three years, that is apparent. Um, so, for example, so the Spice Girls, you know, I grew up as a young kid listening to the Spice Girls, so my age was important there. Um, I'm my queerness and my transness were important in respect to the audience. Um, I think queerness probably more than anything because of, of I think a, a large proportion of the Spice people who consume the Spice Girls do identify as queer. Um, and that audience was important to them and my perspective on that and their show and trying to build something that felt inclusive and accessible um, and like for them or for us was important. Um, and that phrase, like nothing about us without us, um, and like the, a lot of these things have become more, more relevant. And then also now working with artists, um, I work with a lot of women artists or musicians and, um, their interest in working with me is because they've worked with men usually in the past who have dictated their image or what they look like or how they should be seen. And we, we talk about the male gaze and how they're perceived in music videos or how they're perceived in photography and, and sexualized or whatever. And, um, I think there's an interest to work with someone who perhaps has a different perspective with gender, a different perspective with sexuality, um, with with how someone may want to be perceived, and someone who um, is also like up for having those conversations as well, and like analysing an album and thinking about uh, those matters um, when putting together a campaign. Like at the moment, I'm working with the band London Grammar um, uh, as a sort of co-creator on their live show. And Hannah, who writes a lot of the lyrics for the, the, the singer in the, in the band, and I like have these conversations about stuff. Like they're, you know, these conversations are, are intertwined with the creative that we're making and um, the way that she is seen on stage, the way that we... We, we show the band as a whole, you know, all of these things are, are really important. Um, and I enjoy thinking about the music world and the music industry and artists and their perception and their brand and all of this stuff in a larger socio-economic and cultural context rather than just like artist, fans, music, music video. Like I like thinking about other things, I think that's what kind of creates depth as well. And, um, you know, I think it's inevitably the world will become more interesting, the more voices and the more perspectives, um, that get to put work out there. Um, and especially in the creative industries, as we diversify, as we um, create more space for marginalized voices in the creative industries, we will get more interesting things and we won't get stuff that's just a regurgitation or a reinterpretation of something that we've seen a million times. And we will see a bigger challenge to the status quo and like all of this other stuff. And I think artists are interested in being part of that journey. And I think they also want to um, be working with more diverse talent because the industry at a, as a whole is, you know, the, the term male, stale and pale. Like it, it is very much, if you look at all the creative, like all of the graphic designers in music in one of those short lists, I guarantee you that 90% of them, if not more, will be white men. Um, and I've met most of them. <laughs> And some of them have been brilliant at sharing advice and um, fostering a creative flame in me and over the years, you know, lifted me up and put me forward for things. And some of them have told me, you know, so um, there are some great uh, icons of the industry in the design industry who are there to support and, and uplift and make room for new people to come through the door. And there are some people who would rather the door remain shut. Um, and that's fine. And I'm glad I got time to, to meet those people and understand their perspectives because I think it gave me, um, and a lesson like on how to approach things in the future and how to open the door for people myself. And I have, lots of privilege myself 
and I understand that, and I understand that I, I need to be making opportunities and bringing people through the door to work on projects with me um, who wouldn't conventionally maybe get access to those opportunities. And it's one of my, um, like my team's process to like collaborate as much as possible, not just with who works within our walls at the studio, but across the world with people who um, are good references for projects, who have good contribution, whose, whose design style fits in, whose perspective or whose identity is relevant to the work. Um, that's very important to us, like as in design. Um, it's not just, a, you know, for me, if you want to approach design, looking at um, ethics, um, it's really important that you think about everything about the work, who the work is for, who the work is made by, who's getting paid, who's paying you, um, what does the work say? Like all of these things are, are, are important. Um, it's not just about like who's in the picture on the album cover. It's, it's about everything behind the scenes and that, that stuff that you don't see is just as important as the stuff that you do see. And I think um, we spend a lot of time doing that stuff and no one sees it, but that's fine. We don't care that no one sees it. It's important to us and our culture and our values to ensure that that stuff gets done. And um, we're always trying to improve and do the work to make the way we make work as good as possible um, within capitalism. <laughs> I was always interested in like drawing lettering because I'm actually not very good at drawing figurative things. So <laughs> for me, it was more like a, a, a way to like put something down on paper without me having to draw like, I don't know, a horse or a person or whatever. So, uh, I also like there's this, this story around the music and the party scene in London in, around the sort of early noughties, um, mid to late noughties where everyone was a DJ or a musician or in a band because it was kind of like a re-emergence of like DIY culture via the internet and DIY music and people would just be like, yeah, I'm a DJ and like they would bring some CDJ, some burnt CDs from that they downloaded music illegally on the internet. You know, it was like a whole new world in the music industry and, and the kind of scene, the music scene in, in London. So there were all these um, club nights that needed posters with like hundreds of names on them. And for me, I was like, okay, well, I can't fit all of these names big enough and draw or create a graphic image to go with them. So I'm just going to make those names more interesting looking. And I wasn't the only one. There were other illustrators out there who were kind of doing similar thing um, just because we kind of were forced into that result. And um, yeah, I did this flyer series for Sick of Nature, which was originally done by an artist called Tobias Jones. And he, I can't remember exactly what happened, but he was unwell or he didn't want to do the job anymore. And he was like, I've done a couple of flyers for the Sick of Nature um, uh, club night. Do you want to take over the job? So I did. And then I did, I think, five or six flyers for Sick of Nature. And then I was also working for lots of other promoters in London doing illustrated posters and, and flyers for their parties. Um, and again, it was the dawn of MySpace. So that was like when you needed a visual to promote an event. But then it was also like social media at the time was very much a duality between real life and the internet. So it was like you'd go to a party and you'd meet someone and then you would look them up on MySpace and then you might message them and then you might organize to go to parties together. Like nowadays, I feel like the two worlds are a bit further apart. But back then it was like very geographical. It was like, I'm in London, I'm in London. I live in Camden, I live in Camden, whatever. And so that was how we interacted and I got all my work through MySpace. I would message bands I liked and say, oh, can I do a flyer for you? Or I kind of got into coding and I, and I would do re over, overlays and reskins of people's MySpace pages. And then I kind of got a little bit into building websites and I built like the Mystery Jets website. I built Dev Hines' website at the time. I built... Um, I did like a MySpace overlay for Jennifer Lopez's perfume. Like I did all these mad jobs um, and I kept illustrating and um, I kind of had these two main s sort of themes to my work and I, I had I had graduated by this point and I was doing this sort of sort of psychedelic typography and lettering and that was very like commercially successful because you know ad campaigns would want to write things on their posters or uh, magazines would want to have their headlines written next to illustrations whatever 
And then I had this more geometric, more graphic illustration, which was less popular. Um, I think I actually have my old portfolio here. Oh, oh. So yeah, this was, you know, prior to iPads and, um, you know, digital surfaces and stuff. I had one of these that's even bigger. It's like this big. But this is what I took with me to go to um, ad agencies. So I'd sort of take this in and... Um, this had all my my work in it i've now actually retired from my agent but this this was this was one of my first posters um you know it's rough like it's so rough <laughs> but i you know i i did a lot of this sort of typographic illustration and occasionally i'd get the more kind of vector graphic stuff but it wasn't that often I did, yeah, God, I forget, see, I forget a lot of this stuff. Um, I had so many amazing experiences at being a commercial illustrator and, you know, some of the budgets that we used to get were really brilliant. You know, some jobs you could be looking between 30 and 40,000 pounds up to 100K um, for really not a lot of work. This would be when the usage, which is like what you get paid to um, commercially, like sh sort of like the license to use your work commercially. So that could be like international usage for one year or forever or whatever, like depending on the job, that would be so high because we're talking old school ad agency world, not, you know, micro influencers on, micro influencers on Instagram. So, you know, I got some really great jobs and did some, some great work. Um, but to be honest, illustration for me felt very finite. Like I had seen illustrators that I had liked growing up, careers fizzle out and go out of fashion and off trend. And once you're not trendy or, or your style, your approach isn't in, in fashion anymore, where do you work? Like, what do you do? And also with illustration, you tend to get asked to do the same thing over and over again. And I very much hate that. As you could probably tell from my career, like I like to do lots of different things. So the idea that I would like be stuck drawing lettering forever in bright colors and being asked to regurgitate the same thing um, just was my worst nightmare. So I, I did a lot of that <laughs> for a while. I did some great collaborations. I've done packaging. I've done T-shirt designs. I've done billboard campaigns, I've done commercial adverts. Like I, I actually just did like the recent phot Photoshop um, advert where I designed a billboard that was in the ad. Um, but now like for my personal practice as an illustrator, I still do it, but I do it more for myself. I don't really necessarily do it for clients. It's nice when occasionally I get asked to do something, a collaboration or a piece for someone, but it's not like my bread and butter. And um, I, I do it because it's kind of just a natural part of my expression, but I don't, I don't, de I definitely don't do it commercially like I used to. I love painting and I really love digital painting. It's something that I've been doing more of recently and thinking about selling my work um, in additions and like kind of revisiting a lot of that now with, with the time and reflection on my past career. But um, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm an illustrator anymore, though I do do illustration. Um, I think that ship's sailed mostly. Don't de I definitely don't do it commercially like I used to. Um, <coughs> I love painting and I really love digital painting. It's something that I've been doing more of recently and thinking about selling my work um, in additions and like kind of revisiting a lot of that now with, with the time and reflection on my past career. But um, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm an illustrator anymore, though I do do illustration. Um, I think that ship's sailed mostly. I, don't de I definitely don't do it commercially like I used to. Um, <coughs> I love painting and I really love digital painting. It's something that I've been doing more of recently and thinking about selling my work um, in additions and like kind of revisiting a lot of that now with, with the time and reflection on my past career, but um, I, I wouldn't say that I'm an illustrator anymore, though I do do illustration.